All right, I guess that means we are live. Yeah, we're live. Everybody awesome. who is joining us, thanks for thanks for being here. Um, uh, I'm Vivian Juder Frankel. I'm with Pharma Salon. We provide content and conferences for the compounding pharmacy industry. And today, I'm thrilled to have back with us Abby Roth. Um, and she's we're going to be talking about something that made the rounds last month, but which actually we've been talking about a little bit more before then was sampling locations. So Abby, why don't I let you introduce yourself? Thanks. Um, again, thanks for having me back. Um, so uh, my name is Abby Roth. Um, I recently started my own uh, consulting business. So I now work for Pure Microbiology um, and we'll be offering services for environmental monitoring excursions, sampling plans, auditing, SOP help. Um, so kind of doing some of the same things, but a little bit of a, a new venture um, and really looking forward to getting out there and doing some more consulting work again, because something that I missed from having done the training really for like the last like three years. So definitely looking forward to that. Excellent. Well, once again, congratulations on making the move to go out on your own. And Abby also had told me that she's still doing some training, so you guys will still be learning a lot from her. Anyway, as I mentioned, we uh, I had been talking to a couple of people for a while about this topic, and then it, it, Gina Shaw published that piece in Pharmacy, what is it, Pharmacy Practice? Yeah, Pharmacy, pharmacy Practice, practice. News. Yeah, Pharmacy Practice News, and I saw there was a lot of chatter going on on LinkedIn about it. So I thought, okay, well, it featured featured us, which I was thrilled. Featured Abby, so I was like, well, let's let's do a little Q and A about it. So I do want to mention anybody who's listening, of course, you know, go ahead and put your questions in the chat box, and we will answer you questions. These sessions are kind of short. We try to keep them to fifteen to twenty minutes. So hurry up and jump on in if you've got if you've got anything. Um, I'm wondering if we should do a little background. Like, do you see what do you see that made that you think made this an important topic that made um, people tell me about this before the article came out? And then, of course, Gina must have been getting the same information. Yeah. Um, what what is it that you're seeing that is that is so challenging? I, I, this problem has been around since I've been doing this. Um, it, it seems as though specifically, like the 503A pharmacies, those that are doing the sterile compounding just don't know how to choose sampling locations. And I mean, there's good reason for that. They shouldn't need to know um, necessarily because that's not really part of their job. But again, with the evolution of USP 797 and them now having to do sampling and really being responsible for their whole program, this has always been an area where they don't know where to sample, like where's a good place to do it. So um, I think part of it is just the fact that, again, we have pharmacists and pharmacy technicians that are being asked to take on microbiology type roles and they don't know where to actually start with some of that. And um, like I said, this is sampling locations just keeps coming up over and over and over again. So two questions about that. One, are there new 797 requirements, you know, with the new stuff that's all, that's being published or that's being put out there? And second of all, you, you mentioned that pharmacists are now being able to take on microbiology roles. Are they not initially trained in this type of thing? Yeah, so I'll answer that one first. And the answer is no. I mean, that's not something they're going to come out of pharmacy school with any background on, especially not like the environmental monitoring portion of things. Mm -hmm. They're going to have a microbiology course. They'll get some general basics. They'll know what a, a gram positive organism is versus gram negative and some of that kind of stuff. Um, but as far as it relates to the, the viable sampling piece, they're really not going to have kind of, you know, mm -hmm. what they need for that. So um, your other question then was, what again? The new 797 <laughs> oh, requirements. Yes. So as far as that goes, um, we do see some changes from what we saw in 2008, right? The mm -hmm. chapter does give us more specific information about where we need to, to collect samples. So that's there. It's basically what we saw in the 2019 version that came out. Um, mostly what they give guidance on is surface sample locations. Like, hey, we got to make sure we're hitting up those high touch surfaces. And again, 
what is the definition of a high touch surface? And that really leaves it to the organization to kind of decide what that's going to be for them. So mm -hmm. again, that's re putting it all back on them to make that decision. Things like pass throughs need to be sampled. Um, talking about any equipment that's inside primary engineering controls, that'll have to be a surface sample location. So they are pr providing some guidance, um, but as far as the rest of the sample locations, like throughout the rooms, chapter's not going to touch that. Okay, you bring up something that, you know, you ran through very briefly a couple of places that should be tested. But in the article, you also said that you shouldn't leave it up to your third party provider or certifier to choose the sampling locations that you should know better. But mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I have, so again, another two part question is one, obviously there's some general areas that need to be sampled. And two, if the person in charge is generally going to be the pharmacist, how would they know, you know, what it is that they should be sampling? I guess what I'm getting at is why can maybe you elaborate a little bit more on why you shouldn't just go with what the certifier is, is suggesting. Yeah. So and I what are the consequences sound, for not getting the right sampling loca locations? Right. So like, I kind of sound like I'm contradicting myself, right? Where I'm like, <laughs> you're probably not going to know where to sample, but you shouldn't be, you should be the one choosing, right? Yeah. So where that goes to is when we talk about the viable sampling, it all should kind of be a risk-based thing. Like where are we going to have the greatest risk where that CSP or that, that preparation could possibly be contaminated? So the people that know that best are the ones that work in the environment. So your pharmacy technicians, your pharmacists, you know where your high touch surfaces are. You know where you have people moving through the space and where kind of those risky places could possibly be. Now you can definitely work with the certifier to kind of identify the best locations because some of them do have a lot of experience in helping choose sample locations. Some of them don't. So it's knowing what your certifier is able to do for you. And if you can collaborate with them, that'll make for the best sampling plan. But again, it goes back to, you know, your workflow. So you should be the one kind of identifying the best possible locations. Good thing is, is that the certifier might be able to kind of like gauge, hey, you're looking at too many. You might not have quite enough or they'll know locations in the room that maybe don't get really good airflow and they could recommend that you take a sample there. Now, if you're kind of not getting and hitting up those locations that you really want to be hitting, like the consequences of that, it's missing a lot of possible contamination that might be in the space that will ultimately affect, you know, what you have going on from a, a, a safety standpoint for patients, right? So it's trying to balance that sampling of, let me get enough samples in good locations that it's telling me what's actually here versus too many where, God, you don't need all of that data versus, hey, I only collected a handful. I really don't know what's here. So mm -hmm it's the whole thing's a really fine, fine balance. Okay. Thanks. I guess, uh, you know, one of the things that it made me think of is uh, so many things, uh, there seem to be so many operational things that go on where everybody says do a walkthrough. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming maybe that would be helpful as well with the certifier. It's the same sort of thing. Just do a walkthrough maybe with your certifier and then the, you two can identify where the best locations are together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. And if they're going to do your sampling for you, it does really help to work with them to, to choose those locations. Um, mm -hmm. And you kind of want to watch a number of different processes. So it might not just be like a walkthrough first thing in the morning. That's maybe when you're really kind of getting started, you know, as far as the compounding day goes, if you're not a 24 seven operation. So mm -hmm. what are your like worst case compounding scenarios going to be? And that's when you want to do that walkthrough. Got it. Okay. Um, what samples can you take to ensure cleaning is being done properly? So the chapter like kind of refers to that where it's like, oh, hey, surface sampling tells you how good of a job you're doing cleaning. And I'm like, wait, time out. Not quite. So if you sample under dynamic conditions, like the chapter tells you, you're not testing how good of a job you're doing cleaning. You're testing how good of a job you're maintaining cleanliness during operations. So those people that want to kind of do that spot check on cleaning, they want to collect samples during static conditions. So that means nobody's in there doing any sort of work 
it's right after you've cleaned, the area is dry, that's the time to collect some surface samples to see how we did cleaning, right? So that's a good time then to sample locations that I would never tell you to sample otherwise, like ceilings, walls, floors, like weird spots, because now you're spot checking cleaning, right? You're not really taking a look at um, where your, your risk points are from a, a a preparation standpoint. So it's, you can have different sampling plans if, if they want. And I know some locations are moving to doing that where they have their regular routine sampling locations that they take versus this other set to kind of tell them about cleaning. Okay. Is there a schedule that they do the, that other set on? I mean, and I, I guess, I, and again, most people may know the answer to this because maybe there's a schedule for cleaning and that, that lines up. So my uh, lack of experience here. Well, so they'll do a monthly clean, um, but they don't necessarily need to do that post cleaning sampling monthly, something maybe like every six months, even like okay. quarterly, maybe. And really, there's no chapter requirement for it. So it's just information for them to kind of give them that good feeling that personnel are cleaning like they think that they're cleaning. Ah, Okay, excellent. And, and then you kind of touched on this already, but how do you find the balance between too many samples and not enough? Uh, yeah, so chapter kind of requires that you have to have a minimum of like one in each ISO classification. Well, mm -hmm. that can make sense potentially for like the hoods, but it doesn't necessarily make sense for the rooms. And that's really where kind of push for people to do a risk assessment of the facility and look at you know, where do you have a lot of people? Where do you have water? Um, where do you maybe have like poor airflow, uh, high traffic, like lots of touch surfaces and kind of map out the facility to kind of see what you end up having. So the idea though, is not to like over sample, right? Because if you have a cart and you are going to sample every single shelf on that cart, you're probably not really gaining any like benefit. Choose a shelf probably the top one where people are going to put most things down on there um, and move them into like the, the primary engineering control for work. So again, it's just a matter of like, what are you trying to learn from this and choosing locations that give you the most valuable information. So it, it's sometimes hard to say because locations are different or uh, facilities are different sizes. Some are huge, some are tiny, and it's what's the balance in there? The thing is, there's no true right or wrong. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's using your data to learn about the facility and sampling more initially, taking a lot more locations up front and then scaling it back over time is something that actually makes sense um, once you identify where your best locations are. Okay. Um, so again, two questions. One is you mentioned large facilities and small facilities. Should they, they have the same number of um, samples or in a larger facility, are you going to have a lot more sam sampling locations? Yeah, they'll definitely end up with more sampling locations. Um, they'll probably have totally different like workflow processes that they're going to want to make sure that they're not getting contamination in um, from like lesser ISO classifications. So, right. But yeah. presume, and, sorry, go ahead. No, you're, you're, you're all good there. <laughs> I was going to say, and presumably since it's a larger facility and you have all, I mean, I guess what I, why I ask is, you know, you said you don't want to have too many data points, but presumably a larger facility has the, um, better capabilities to crunch all the, that larger amount of data. I mean, yeah. and it needs to, does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Those larger compounding entities are going to need that data just because they are probably having a much higher throughput um, mm -hmm. on what they're preparing. And with the amount of stuff going out the door like that, you have greater risk then as well. So right. it's, it's all and, all that, that balance. And when we save larger facilities, that includes 503Bs, right? Because I know included. mostly we're talking about 503As, but did, did that apply, this applies to 503Bs? Yeah, and they're probably going to have way more locations than an A is just to begin with. Um, right. And their expectation will absolutely be without a doubt that they mm -hmm. have kind of validated their sample locations that they've chosen and have rationale as to why they chose all of them 
because that's something the FDA would be looking for. Right. And then you also mentioned how you start with, you can start with more data and then, or more locations and then narrow those down. I'm assuming that's because when you start with a large amount of data, you'll kind of see where the problem areas are, and then you can just follow up where you consistently see the problem areas rather than having to, you know, sample out everything. Yep. That's absolutely right. Okay, great. Is there a way to rotate sample locations like on carts or shelving? Yeah, there definitely is. Um, and one of the things that we always talk about is having consistent sampling locations so that from you know month to month or week to week, however frequently you're sampling, you can trend those data points. But with carts and shelving, um, you could set up where you rotate through each shelf, you know, mm -hmm. and you do the top shelf month one, the middle shelf month two, and then the bottom shelf month three, and then you start that cycle over again. Um, so you're really there kind of looking at and trending what's on the cart, not necessarily what's on the cart at a particular location. So for places that have a lot of carts that they do store a lot of things, this might be a good opportunity for them to kind of rotate at least through that, and they can still trend that data together. Okay, great. Thanks. And who from the pharmacy should be in, involved in choosing these uh, sampling locations? That's a great question because I actually love having pharmacy technicians involved with it. The people that are actually in doing the compounding, um, because on the day to day, they can tell you what they're touching, where people are hanging out, um, where those risk points are. Um, so whether it's a technician or a pharmacist, but people that are in the room um, can definitely be involved with choosing, uh, helping choose those locations and at least giving you a really good starting point of, hey, here's a list of where we might want to at least consider sampling. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I feel like at this point we should, uh, I want to say two things, which is one is this ties into what we talked about last time, which is the certifier behavior. Um, and I also want to mention, you know, hang on, now I've got two things going on in my head. Um, I had pulled up this video. I was going to put the link in. This is on the environmental monitoring for ISO 8, if anybody is interested in this. I know you talk a lot about the sampling in here, and yeah. um, I just thought people might be interested in it. But going back to the certified behavior, behavior, if anybody wants to watch that, we talked a lot about the uh, or maybe you want to recap, you know, making sure that your certifier isn't contaminating your locations. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as, as part of that, it's really making sure that whoever's coming in and doing your sampling, whether it's a certifier or you have somebody within your organization that that comes in and does it, that they know how to garb based on your, you know, your policy. They're dressed appropriately, clean clothing, good personal hygiene, because if not, all of that can negatively impact the sampling that you're doing, and then you end up having investigations that you have to get into that you really right. don't want to get into. And here, I'm posting the link to that conversation last week, or last time as well. Great. So um, anyway, does anybody have any questions? We're about, uh, you know, we've done our time. I guess not. Anyway, Abby, thank you very much. As always, it's always a pleasure to have you. And Thanks anybody who is listening, me. yeah, well, like I said, it's always fun. Anybody who's listening, uh, you know, Abby's Abby's going to come on regularly. So um, come check us out next time we, we we do this. Anyway, thanks very much, Abby. Have a great day. Yep. Thanks. You too. All right. Bye. Bye.